Welcome to the Core Concepts Lectures. This is a series of lectures where we invite people from many different religious disciplines, uh, churches, and um, not so traditional systems to talk about what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. That's the three questions that we've asked our, our speakers to address. Today we have what I consider to be a non-traditional. He refers to himself as a, a corporate refugee, a recovering seminarian, a self-taught artist, but I know him as an intuitive who works with people using his art and, um, and always in demand. And so we've asked John Madsen to be with us today and to talk to you. So let me turn the program over to John. Thank you very much, James. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the topic that I've chosen, the words that I've chosen to describe my topic with are the prism of perception. And I'm going to analogize it to trying to explain, say, to, to introduce people to, say, the workings of the internal combustion engine. The wor workings of the internal combustion engine could be described fairly briefly. I'm trying to get somebody, trying to show somebody how to repair one takes a good deal of time. My concept, my root concept, can be articulated fairly quickly, but I've spent a number of years, as it turns out, accumulating the, um, the insights and the reading and, and doing some of the research into how this mechanism functions. So, the idea that I've developed is that we exist within an internal landscape. Our circumstances, our surroundings, our endeavors, our relationships, etc. Over the course of time, as we pass from infancy to adulthood, we accumulate what's really a matrix of means by which we perceive. And those perceptions then take our external circumstances and turn them into our own unique individualized internal landscape. So that um, whatever our circumstances are, we experience them per the individuality of our experience and our prism of perception. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand this mechanism of how we perceive the world because it's been my experience on many occasions, and we can think of a dozen cliches right off the bat, where two people can be in exactly the same circumstance and have two deeply different individualized circumstances mm -hmm. simply because the prism of their perception is different. So. We exist within an internal lens. We exist within an external landscape. We experience our own inner landscape, and where we do this is in a very mysterious place called the brain. And I'll throw out a couple of thoughts as opening quotes uh, from Hippocrates. We find, "Quote: The brain and the brain alone. In the from the brain and the brain alone arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, and jests." as well as our sorrows, pains, and griefs. So, those wise words from antiquity. From more recent times, um, Arthur Kessler, who was well known as a philosopher and writer in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, spoke of the brain as follows. The evolution of the brain not only overshot the needs of prehistoric man, it is the only example of evolution providing a species with an organ which it does not know how to use. And, which is, you know, that's that's a delightful, that's a delightfully ironic phrase. But I've come over time. And I read that phrase for the first time when I was 15, probably 45 years ago. And I've come in time to understand that it's true, because I see around me rational and well-intentioned people, rational and well-informed people, certainly, doing foolish things that they have somehow convinced themselves make perfect sense. We all know, as a, as a real obvious example, we all know that it makes no sense to let infants play with matches. But somehow large numbers of people are convinced that it makes a great deal of sense to let governments have nuclear weapons. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the two situations are exactly the same situation, on, on, on one on a much larger scale than the other. So, all our experiences take place in the brain, and everything that we experience is detectable as electrical activity within the brain, possibly with a few exceptions. But in general, it's a safe statement to say that the brain is the theater wherein we play out our lives. 
And one of the things that um, is kind of traditional in Indo-European thinking, or Western European thinking, is the concept that thought, emotion, and spiritual experience are somehow differentiate, differentiated. That your thoughts are one type of thing, that rational activity is, one, is a, a beast of one nature, emotions are a beast of another nature, your belief system is a beast of a third nature. Um, when really they're all happening simultaneously in the same place, and it's called the brain. So, from what I've come to understand from studying what we now know about the brain, and what we know today has been um, illuminated to a great deal by um, recent technological developments in the area of brain mapping, where they have techniques where they can place probes on a person's brain, ask them to consider a situation or a dilemma, and actually see what our areas of the brain are becoming activated. And one of the things, interestingly enough, that's been found is that we often make what we think of as ethical or even analytical decisions in the parts of the brain where we experience emotions. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, I'm going to talk for a little bit about how that came to be as the brain was designed over evolutionary time. Um, more specifically, to go back to Arthur Kessler, when he refers to the brain and the human brain, more specifically, he would be talking about what we know of as the, cell, the, uh, the cerebellum, what I call the cortical brain, the neocortex. The brain is really three different structures. And I'm, I'm, this is kind of a loose analogy, but it's essentially so. People speak in terms of the forebrain, the, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The hindbrain, the structure of the hindbrain, um, goes back into 500 million years when essentially we were complicated creatures were complicated amoebas and they needed a central switching system to monitor sensory data as it came in to decide if the organism was well. And then as over evolutionary time as organism became more complex, it needed to they needed a switching system to monitor and regulate what we now call the autonomic nervous functions, breathing, stomach digestion, circulation of blood and so forth. And as creatures got to a level of complexity where they developed limbs that had specialized functions and learned to grasp and interrelate with their environment more, in more complex ways, the mammalian brain developed. And the mammalian brain is, or the remnants of the mammalian brain are, um, they began to experience or they began to drive functions that were more than just sensory input and output and there was the beginnings of what we could now recognize as social structures. For example, wolves hunt in packs, um, migratory instincts, um, and some other things, which we in animals, when we see them being played out in animal behavior, we call them imperatives or instincts, which to my mind is just another way of phrasing that we don't really understand what's happening there. And if we look, one of the things that I've enjoyed as I've read up and tried to stay current on science over the years, is that one of the conclusions I've come to over time is really that there are a lot of things that we can see going on at what we would consider lower levels of activity than we in our exalted human state that seem to own as much intelligence as anything we do. <clears throat> and I'll give you a couple of examples. All life on Earth is sustained by the process of photosynthesis which is very simple, a molecule of a mineral is matched with a molecule of water and it is held up in front of light which activates, which triggers the release of an electron and that begins this enormous cascade of events that, that generate both oxygen and all the carbohydrate that the food chain, is, is, uh, the food chain needs to sustain life and yet we wouldn't say that there's any, there's any evidence of mental activity there, it's just something that happens through chemistry. So maybe a better example is um, a species of carpenter ants that have been studied in Asia lately that they think are about 11 million years old. And these carpenter ants are farmers in every sense of the word. Um, what they do is they forage out into their environment and they find the leaves of, a, of, a, of one specific tree, which they cut into ribbon-like sections. And these sections of leaf get dragged back down to the den into the hole underground, the den underground, 
where workers come along and chew but do not swallow these leaves. They masticate them and turn them into a pulp. And then there's an enzyme in their saliva that causes a fungus to grow on these leaves, which in due course they come along and harvest and use to feed the colony. So one of the, what, has, what anthropologists have always considered to be a really important development in human stage and development of human evolution in society, agriculture, is being practiced by these creatures that have very little of what we would call detectable intelligence and they were doing it for some millions of years before we were. So, the whole, the whole issue of consciousness and awareness is, I've come to be convinced, something other than, is driven by something other than what we measure and refer to as intelligence quotient. So the way I summarize that in the outline here is that brain activity is governed by brain structure. The midbrain, the forebrain, the hindbrain perform different functions, but they function simultaneously, and the cortex, which is where we do most of the things that we think of as uniquely human, we keep our checkbooks here, we speak in languages here, we operate computers here, we navigate our automobiles in the cortex, our, that portion of the brain is not necessarily as dominant as we tend to think. Um, we find emotional and rational thinking intertwined, and what we do is we develop what we call consciousness, and this is the root of um, our prism, is we form neural networks. The brain essentially does two things. It intakes and organizes information, and then it remembers it. So very early in consciousness, we begin to, um, well, let me step that, let me pause, hold that thought, and step right to the second of what I have outlined as core concepts here. The formation of this prism is individualized and ongoing. Now the primary mechanism of it is the formation of neural networks, but it's primarily a subconscious process and it's influenced over, it influences things that, over which we don't have control. Um, it seems that we are genetically preconditioned to be either right-brained or left-brained, but we know that it has a, a distinct, um, there's a big distinction there between individuals who think mostly in terms of linear thinking or an emotional perception, and that's governed by that precondition, preconditioning to using the right or the left lobe of the cortex. Um, socialization, which is a broad label, they're finding can begin at a really, really early level. There's a um, there's a study of early childhood development being done either at Harvard or Yale, but it, it, they call it the baby lab, and what they what they do is study they they develop experiments that give them insights into um, social expression, social perceptions that are already formed within infants as young as three months. And uh, there was a segment on them in 60 Minutes. And what they found is that young infants as young as three months can form their perception that when shown two dolls, one of the dolls may be more or less like me. And they manipulate this perception with different stimuli, such as the two, the two dolls might be wearing different colored clothing, one of which is the same as the baby. They have found that these mechanisms can be as, um, these distinctions can be made on mechanisms as fine as the baby, one doll or the other doll is eating the same kind of cracker I am, the other is eating the other. But when this child had, when the child has a, a response to a stimulus that signifies same as me or different from me, the child has emotional reactions. The child may, the infant, may react very negatively to the doll who is perceived as being like me experiencing suffering, whereas the doll who is experienced as being perceived as being different from me, when that doll is seen in distress of some sort, the infant remains kind of neutral. Um, so these distinctions are beginning at a very early age. And in fact, from what early childhood experts understand, the first thought process that evolves in a child's mind, and remember what a newborn child's mind is, is sitting there trying to detect some order in this chaotic swarm of random, seemingly random sensory data. But at some point, the infant begins to experience that, oh, some of this data is me. Some of this is other. 
and from that sense of self and other, and I, I kind of add, semi-sarcastically, we form the self-other perception and then spend the rest of our lives trying to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> but once this self and other perception is formed, we then begin to identify different variations on other and form associative complexes, hierarchies, etc. For example, beginning to, like our little three-month-old with watching puppets, other person, other person like me, other person not like me, people who are seen very frequently, of course, the parents, the caregivers, etc., become authority figures. Um, playmates are not authority, uh, understood as authority figures, etc. And all of these impressions and experiences are being recorded in neural networks. And the neural network can be just understood, it's, it's the mechanism by which the brain remembers. Different parts of the brain store different types of experience. Sound is heard in certain types of the brain, tactile senses in, in other parts of the brain, different emotions are experienced in different parts of the brain, but every time an individual has an experience, the brain links using mechanisms of memory that aren't really well understood yet, but links the different components of that experience. And over time as we grow and we have similar experiences, they, these neural links can be understood as crossing each other. So I think we've all probably had the, and here's a good example of it, I think we've all had the, the experience of trying to remember somebody's name and remembering another name that begins with the same letter. Yeah. I'm trying to remember James' name and I come up with Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's because the, there is a cross-referencing mechanism there that detects a similarity but doesn't, doesn't operate finely enough to come up with a distinction that, oh, that's Joe and that's James. So these neural networks are forming. And of course, as we, be, as we mature and develop, these neural networks and their structures within them get increasingly complex. Now, also influenced by how we are experiencing things and what kind of a neural network we build within them are certain types of subliminals. We know that color experience affects emotions differently. If this room had been painted a hot pink, we would all be having a slightly different emotional experience as we're here. Musical notes, um, things that are, that are experienced in certain types of sequences. Um, with children, we all use, the, we use sequence when we train them not to do things. The child experiences picking up the match and we say no, or we take the match out of their hands. They link, they understand that the sequence has meaning, if the sequence were otherwise, it wouldn't attach the same meaning. And I think, so over time, you know, consider two little kids kicking a ball around in, a, in an empty yard. And they're learning so many things, and in a way, it's dialogue, and it can be understood almost as, as um, creative play. Okay? And let's say this is the age of two years, three years. Well, fast forward what we see going on there to the same two kids maybe at the age of 17 or 18 playing basketball in school. They're still doing fundam fundamentally and mechanically the same thing. They're manipulating around an object. They're sharing it and moving it in directions and achieving goals. But I think the, the fundamental, the experience has been fundamentally altered because of all the perceptions that have been put together and in interlocking structures of meaning that are what they are now experiencing that moment in that, in that activity through. Um, and I, I mentioned a while ago some, some things that, um, the, the thing about matches versus nuclear weapons. We can come across people in our lives that cling to things that they know not to be true. Or they will cling to a belief in the face of information that tells them their belief is erroneous. I remember working for a guy a few years ago. Nice man. Very, he, he was kind. He was nice. He was agreeable. But he was very heavily influenced by things that he remembered his father telling him in his childhood. And his father was a captain in the police department in Memphis. And one day this fellow described to me that he was about eight or nine, and his dad took him in the family car and drove him through housing projects. And he said, look at what's happening around you, because I'm going to tell you something. And he, re 
he repeated one of the one of the oldest and most distasteful things in the lexicon of racial dialogue. He said, "These people are outbreeding us. They're going to outnumber us, and they're going to take over the world." And this guy I worked for thought he was still seeing that in the world around him. So I went home, got on the computer, found it, went to the U.S. Census Bureau's website, and downloaded a very simple run chart that showed the, that the percentage of African Americans in American society has remained essentially the same between 10 and 12 percent since 1910. And I put this in front of him, and I said, Mike, I'm sorry, but your dad was wrong. And he didn't even look at it. He threw it right in the trash. So let's think about why that is happening. Certainly not for intellectual reasons, and I'm, and I'm here to tell you that that guy was a bright guy. He, he, he ran his own, he was running a pretty upscale used car lot. That's how he earned his money. He dealt with numbers, he dealt with accounting, he dealt with selling techniques, he was a skilled communicator. But this one small, simple, incontrovertible expression of fact was more than he was willing to absorb. And why? Not for logical reasons, but because of the prism of his perception. For him to have accepted that as fact, he would have had to have dethroned the highest figure, and the highest ranking figure in his per personal mythology. So that's emotion. Yes. Emotion controlling analytical. It's what we, yes, we, a lot, I think a lot, that's one of those cases where people would refer to a particular an emotional reaction and say that instinctively he's defending his dad. Instinct, because we don't know how to explain it, other than that it is emotion. And, and, and that harkens back to what I was saying in the beginning when we considered, or saying earlier, when we considered the brain, all these types of processes, emotion, social impulses, genetic stuff that we may have been predisposed to, early childhood, later childhood, things we think we have learned in adulthood that can't be proved. They all happen and influence us simultaneously. And I submit, going back to my metaphor about there being an internal landscape, if we could have looked at that man's internal landscape, I have no doubt it was that the figure, in the, the tallest figure most in the foreground is his dad. Dead for many, low these many years. Um, similarly, Similarly, but slightly differently. I have a, my, my own mother is, um, bless her heart, 87 years old, raised a Catholic, very conservative Catholic, very staunch Republican. And from and an educated woman by anybody's standards. She has, uh, she nearly completed a master's in history, certified to be a Montessori teacher, etc. and so forth. It's interesting though, that according to my scenario, her personal prism had been formed because of when she was born, very largely before World War II. Certainly the majority of it before 1950, and almost entirely before 1960. And we, so that to some degree my mom lives in very much her own version of reality. And I remember we were having a conversation one day about how she enjoys listening to Midnight Coast to Coast. Mm -hmm. And she she, I could hear the anger in her voice as she shared with me how furious and frustrated she got when people talked about reincarnation because there's no scientific proof of reincarnation. But my mother adheres to a belief system that says that Jesus, the savior of the human race, was born of a virgin and thus, as we know now, had only 50% of the genetic material necessary to construct a human body. Okay, and so her criteria of requiring scientific proof of your opinion doesn't require that I have scientific proof of my opinion. And really, I use the word opinion in that case, and it's kind of a misnomer. Because what had happened is, in my mom's mythology, back in the early days when she was constructing the personal mythology that inhabits her inner landscape, she transferred the power of belief. She vested certain people with the power of belief who told her things that she still believes as absolute immutable fact without a shred of anything they call scientific evidence. As a Catholic, she believes that Jesus ascended into heaven. 
that there was literally a day when Jesus' corporeal body, which had already been resurrected, mm -hmm. broke the bounds of gravity, ascended upwards mm -hmm. into what we now know to be the, <laughs> the absolute cold of deep space, mm -hmm. and presumably traveled towards and maybe even arrived at a place that's never been perceived by humans, or never been experienced by humans. There, there's no empirical data about it. So well, she we, is, we don't know what was in that cloud. It's probably a ship, right? <laughs> I, 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 leave it, I leave that. I leave that conclusion, that speculation, to the the, uh, the endless creativity of the human imagination. But for my mother and her co-believers, mm -hmm. there is. Um, that willingness to suspend critical disbelief, which she applies in so many other areas of her. And that brings us to a really interesting phenomenon in what we call awareness. There's a book that's being published, or that, that has been recently published, by a guy who's a neurosurgeon, check time, who um, contracted meningitis, went into a coma, and was brain dead for a period of about a week, and they had actually made the decision to remove life support as he began to come to. And over a period of months following his emergence from coma, he put together these wisps of memory that became a narrative that he expresses of his book, wherein he believes very firmly he experienced a place called heaven, a place that he refers to as heaven. That he, uh, and, and there's a lot of convincing data in what he says. And he is a neurologist. He understands that he was not dreaming because his cortex was flatlined. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is convincing scientific evidence that there was nothing going on in his brain in terms of all the things that we do in the brain. He wasn't seeing anything. He wasn't hearing anything. He wasn't touching anything. And he certainly couldn't be conjuring anything out of imagination to be having dreaming. But So he has now come to belief. And belief is, to me the most mysterious and maybe the grandest thing that occurs in the whole realm of what we call consciousness. Um, and this has to do with the portion of my prism analogy that refers to the power of spirituality, which unfortunately gets mistranslated into the experience of religion. Mm -hmm. And we have people saying things must be rational, but they can also be non-rational at the same time. Um, it seems to have been something that we did as we emerged from the state of hominids into the state of humanoids. Uh, I have a picture in my, my mind of the first time it happened, this, this sweet little hairy caveman sitting in the mouth of his cave behind his fire and looking up at the stars and going, there's something else there. There is an other. I sense it and I wish to be there. I wish to be there. So, of course, over time, we did all the, we took that capacity for belief and communicated it to each other via various narratives and sequences and symbols and images, and it became spirituality. And here's where we recently perceived something very different than what we had imagined before. It's been a, um, in the science of anthropology, it's long been an article of faith that the sequence by which humans evolved was that we were hunter-gatherers, we began to gather in clans, um, we developed agriculture. Because we had agriculture, we began to form stable communities, which led to permanent buildings, which then allowed the specialization of labor, one of which was, and artistic and social activities, one of which became religion. And that sequence was held to be very set. Agriculture, fixed communities, specialization of labor, social activities, including religion. And they thought it all began about eight to 10,000 years ago. There is an archeological dig that is being excavated now. It's in Western Turkey and it dates back some, to something like 11,000 years, or roughly 1,000 years before the first evidence of agriculture and permanent dwellings. And in many ways, remarkably, this building, this thing that people, humans were building, was composed of stones that were sitting upright 
in a large series of rings. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion is, the conclusion to which they've come, because they're, the stones are decorated, there's figuring in them, there seems to be narrative, they've concluded that these, this assemblage of humans was working on building a temple, what could be understood as a temple or a place of worship. And the size of the undertaking was such that they calculated it, it took something like 300 people working on the site on a permanent basis for it to go forward. And of course, there had as, as hunter-gatherers, there had to be an enormous uh, network of people gathering <coughs> and hunting food to feed these 300 people. Mm -hmm. And that it was driven by the impetus to feed this group of people who were working over a number of generations that humans began to identify what was going on in their environment that they could replicate. And so very near this site, they have now found the oldest evidence of architecture and the oldest evidence of permanent dwellings. But that sets that whole sequence in reverse. Instead of starting with architecture and, 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 and graduating towards worship, this archaeological find is reversing that sequence and beginning it with community spiritual activities mm -hmm. trending towards permanent building and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that because I'm so convinced that this power of belief, whether it's in the rightness of my daddy, the rightness of a political system, the right, rightness of a particular religious belief system, is something that's very core and unique to humans. So I've come to understand the idea of faith differently. Um, and, I, and I would explain it this way. I have uh, the power of sight. At the moment, I'm looking at Julie. Julie is not my sight. She's what I perceive. I have the capacity of belief. What I structure as the object of that belief is not necessarily the act of believing. So if I believe, if, if I'm a Buddhist, a Taoist, a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim, I have an object of my belief, but my, that, that object is not the experience of my belief. My, it's not the same as my experience of belief. And because of the ways, because of our experiences, our predilections, the things we're taught, we take that belief and we vest it in the world around us as we grow and develop as humans. So comes a time in everybody's life when the sequence of events that's playing out in your external circumstances seems to suggest that you have learned everything you need to know. I've learned, I've gone to school and learned my job. I've formed a family and learned the rules of being a family person, etc., and so forth. I've had developmental experiences, I've integrated them, I act on them, and I'm being rewarded with some, some experience that suggests I've learned successfully. And what happens to our prison? Um, that leads us to the next. We become vested in the status quo. It's at the top of the second page of the outline. We quit growing. Um, if, we, if at one point in the workplace, we brought to our workplace some technological advancement of which we were the master, we achieved stature within the workplace based on our relationship with that technology or that process or that material. Mm -hmm. The sad truth of it is, is we become vested in the status quo and at that moment we begin to become obsolete. Um, I'm sure we all remember, um, oh, what was the name of the book about how society, as, as humans grow and evolve, we keep changing at a faster and faster rate. The number of increments of change, you know, the time at which increments of change take place becomes shorter. Um, and it also becomes kind of a psycho-emotional state, too, that's being vested in the status quo. Well, let's face it, you know, I played football when I was in high school. I like the game, football. I love to watch a good football game. But only so many football games are going to give me the richness of emotional reward that they did in my early years. Um, I love to catch fish. I used to spend a lot of time fishing. You can only catch so many of the same type of fish before we have to move on and upwards. And so it is in spirituality, in the experience of spirituality. 
Spirituality is very personal. It can be very intense. But remember that it always keeps us guided towards an other. Friedrich Nietzsche defined, the German philosopher, defined humans as being arrows of aspiration, and that we always long for this other. So if we are too heavily invested in the status quo, not only do we do things that may be illogical, or hold beliefs that may be illogical, but particularly if you look at the world of mental illness and substance abuse, you find people engaging in very, very painful behaviors over and over and over again. We learn to cling, if we are overly invested in the status quo, we learn to cling to pain. There's some data on this sheet that relates to the evolution of uh, the, the evolution of spiritual expression in the early days of human civilization. But what I've come to understand, and what I've experienced in my own life, is that if I look for fulfillment, if I look for a sense of being well placed in the world by doing more of things that I've learned to do by developing my cortical skills, if I learn to, if I keep questing to catch another larger fish, I just wind up wanting more, 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 and never quite getting that stage of satisfaction which I have come to understand is attainable only through revisiting the source of my own spiritual experience, sources of my own spiritual experience. Now, if somebody asked me what my faith system was, I would say that I'm a hybrid between um, a pantheist and a Taoist. So it's all very ethereal to me. But what I've come to understand and what I'm here to affirm today is that if we use the nature of our spiritual experience and the sense of faith as, as being something that drives us towards. If we can use that as, if we can capture that energy and use it to examining our own prisms of perception. Why do I believe what I do believe? Why do I experience what I experience? Um, why do I repeat certain types of behavior? Why do I try and innovate other behaviors? Why am I, why does the external circuit circumstance look the way it does in my inner landscape. If we can bring ourselves to personal growth through a process that helps that prism reform and alter over time, then the interior landscape ceases to be the status quo. The, inter the interior landscape will continue to change. If we change our understandings and our perceptions, we can use events that we experience in memory and experience them differently. I remember, for example, very, very Christinely, a day when our children were, I think, about three and eight, and I came home from work, and they both came running as fast as they could across the front lawn, saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. I remember, I experienced that in that moment in a particular way, but I'm convinced that now when I, when I revisit that memory, in the light of having watched them grow into adulthood, in lieu of my own experiences of my own aging, I understand that moment very differently than I did then. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my inner landscape, and, and we can all do this, my inner landscape isn't static. It's a frontier. Mm -hmm. And what the things I do with my art, I like to think are postcards from the interior frontier. Mm -hmm. So life becomes dynamic, challenging, rewarding at the same time, and always moving towards, in faith, what I've, the way I experience spirituality in my own life. Do we have questions? Immediately? Uh, I think it's very interesting when you're, you're talking about which comes first, the process, and uh, talking about the uh, spirituality coming before the, the structures and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but there's two books. One uh, called Small is Beautiful and the other one A Guide for the Perplexed by E.F. Schumacher. And he puts forward the, the theory that there are only four fields of knowledge. One is knowledge of self, which all of the great masters have taught us to look at first, and then knowledge of others, 
and then the knowledge of others' view of us, mm -hmm. and then fourth, the field of science that we know of, which is the study of what's already happened, mm -hmm. or, or, or what we call science uh, today. I wonder if you might comment on that in relation to the theories that you put forward. Well, something that, um, uh, a train of thought that popped into my mind, um, it reminded me of um, an experience that, or a perspective, that was uh, described by Carlos Castaneda at the end of his third book, Journey to Islam, and was also articulated by a French theologian early in the 20th century, Mercia de Eliot, in the book, The Myth of the Eternal Return. Which is as much as, and, and it, and it kind of ties into the Buddhist concept of the cycle of life, as much as we think of our salvation journey, whatever it is, as a movement towards a point, um, a lot of the early belief structures taught humans to believe that they're returning to um, a prior state of higher being. And if you look at the, so if you combine that idea with the notion of the, you know, the, the circle of life, if we stand at the top of the circle of life and, and move forward, eventually we approach that same point from behind. Um, and if you couple that with mentioning science, where uh, theoretical physics has gone in the last 10 or 20 years, understanding that the physical universe we live in is multidimensional, although we only perceive three of what they think are as many as a, what they, the, the equations they use work out to uh, 11, currently, 11 dimensions. We can see that our notions of things like time and sequence and hierarchy um, are dominated by our existence in three dimensions when it's, it really cannot be so. so one of the things I, uh, I mentioned is we use the word hierarchy in how we arrange the world in our minds, you know, higher is good, lower is bad. How does that make sense in a multidimensional world? It doesn't. But nonetheless, the notion of hierarchy is something we find my friend applying that to, you know, he, he gave his dad hierarchy in his mythology. My mom gave her catechism teachers hierarchy. You know, I have to search for who I placed in positions of hierarchy when I was at, at that age and so forth. So I don't know if you regard that as responsive to your question or to your observation, but that's what came to mind. Well, he, he, um, he was basically saying that if you don't know yourself, that's where everything begins. If you don't know yourself, how can you possibly know anyone else? And if you don't understand and know something about people and understand them, how can you possibly understand what they're thinking about you is? Uh, and these, and that these three are so important that the science that we know of today is really almost unimportant in in relation to how important it is these these first three uh, fields of knowledge. Yes, and part of what my model, how my model conforms to that is, you know, we are experience. We are our history. We are we are very definitely in how we interact. We are our memories, and you are, and you are the memories I have of experience with others like you, until we begin the process of interaction, mm -hmm. and hopefully learn differently. Mm -hmm. It's like stereotypes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that's learning the, who somebody else is. Do you have a question? Um, actually, if I'm still slated, slated for next week, uh, you're an excellent uh, lead-in, yeah. uh, because, uh, because uh, my, my discussion will be on Rudolf Steiner, uh, and he, he felt that the spiritual uh, slash soul, the non-physical, was the primary source, with the physical being a reflection, as it were. Uh, one of his early examples, to when he was trying to be uh, a philosopher and not a uh, uh, clairvoyant teacher uh, was uh, was you need to think about thinking uh, because thinking itself is a outcome of the non-physical world uh, and that a component of thinking uh, 
properly done matches ourselves with the external world. In other words, uh, uh, the concepts we have come actually from, the, from an aspect of the external world that we perceive properly by thinking. Uh, anyway, uh, to, 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 the, to the extent that, uh, uh, that you keep saying brain, neurology, neural networks, uh, he, uh, he would put the opposite assumption, which, which is mind is uh, effectively outside the body, the brain is a receiver there too. I don't think uh, that there's a physical-based uh, experiment you can do that could distinguish between these two concepts, uh, these two approaches, other than, uh, than the fact that you have a lot more mental freedom if you're not always limited to brain or materiality. Anyway, he felt the spiritual world and the soul world was objective once one, once one developed the proper senses. And anyway, so that's... Uh, I would mesh that, okay. except with that, by saying that none of what I've found or none of what I've turned into repositories of belief right. in my system um, excludes, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in like the Jungian concept set of the collective collective right. superconsciousness. Mm -hmm. I've thrown out to people before the idea that maybe the internet came along when it did to teach us all to live, to give to be like training wheels for the development of the collective superconsciousness. So I so what I would have to hold fast to though mm -hmm. is that my experience, including thought, mm -hmm. including banging my fist on the table, mm -hmm. my experience is has been, what's the word, empirically demonstrated to occur as an event in my great manner. So that I think any of us would, would have to admit that we're, if, if we look at a flat line, uh, at a human body whose brain is flat line, right. it's very difficult to detect anything we call flat. Uh, and, and what was the, the but, but, the, but the fellow who, the, the doctor that you mentioned, had this experience of yes. with a flat line situation. So there's a gray area somewhere between um, what we, you know, the brain as an organ, what we can, we can experience using the brain as an organ in a three-dimensional world. I remember my little caveman, who was who just absolutely just knew with every fiber of his being that other was present as well as this. Mm -hmm. oh. So that's the frontier where we begin to experience spirituality. Uh, and uh, Steiner's assumption would be exactly the reverse, that we, are, we were coming out of the spiritual world, gaining knowledge of working in the physical, that uh, our pantheism reflected largely earlier states of consciousness in which we were seeing soul and spirit in everything, and greater and lesser gods and divinities and earth gods and so forth. And as we got more tied into the physical material world, uh, we lost that, we were losing that phase of consciousness through a glass darkly and so forth, mm -hmm. and gaining our rational capabilities. Uh, so basically, he's taking the model you have, taking the opposite, the assumptions, and flipping it on the other side as to which is cause, which is effect. Which is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, to the extent that what I've done here yeah. is largely in exercise in cerebral activity, yeah. which I started off by noticing the futility of. <laughs> if I quote from Arthur Kessler. I don't think, well, you, I don't, I don't think you're here when I read that. Can I share it with you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, I think we don't bore it. You, have, you have it in there. I have it here. I, I noticed that. My, yeah. Uh, About the, the brain being something we don't know. Yes. We don't fully understand how to use. Um, mm -hmm. Two other fast points. Uh, Steiner's view of reincarnation and life is not the circle of life, but the spiral. We come with a lot out of the primordial wisdom. We gain experience here, which is something new, so we match part of what, uh, what comes from our history with part of what we learn here, and then advance that to another cycle. So his view is, is uh, spiral. And we have a split. The eastern view is of 
circle of life, and the Western view was of history as linear. Point A to point B. Yeah, where, where, whereas his is uh, if you stretch it's the spiral, if, you, if you take the circle and stretch it out, you have a spiral. You have to be sure and come back next week so, should, you, can, sure so you can critique him when he's when he's no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 the, and the third thing was actually he he wrote a book called Frederick Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, Fighter for Freedom uh, in which he made uh, what someone uh, what others would disagree with uh, uh, the conventional wisdom is that Nietzsche went crazy uh, because uh, of syphilis. Uh, his view of Nietzsche, uh, based on some on clairvoyant perceptions, as well as seeing him once and dealing with his archives uh, under his sister's auspices, was that Nietzsche was ferociously honest, and he was ferociously into the uh, assumption behind uh, physical sciences, which is that the material world is all that exists, and with his with his his thinking, with his with this limitation, he was basically fighting himself all the time until uh, until he cracked. But it is the simple short form of a full book discussion that have Steiner accused of being a Nietzsche person when in fact he just claimed to you know understand and and honestly appreciate other people's viewpoints. And he, and he was quoting Nietzsche a little bit earlier. Do do, yeah, you, do, either, that's where, do either of you ladies have a question? Okay. Did you have any final statement or? Uh, Peace and love to all y'all. <laughs> we want to thank uh, John for being with us today and, and for this lecture. And it's certainly different. Uh, I think the closest thing we've had to something like this was Shiva Mucci's uh, talk. And I want to thank you very much, John, for being with us. And we want to thank you for being with us on the Core Concepts Lecture.